Take your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 in our Bibles as we begin the journey for the next few weeks through the Christmas story. And we're going to start, we're really going to focus our attention on one particular, I'd say truth, it's a, it's a word, the word Emmanuel, talking about the idea of the gift of his presence. Would you follow along? This was read just a few moments ago, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says this, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins." Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, this is the prophet Isaiah, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Father, we love you. We thank you for the wonderful privilege you've given to us to worship you today, to be here, to enjoy, Lord, everything that we have been able to enjoy as we look to you. Father, the, the Christmas season comes with so many different emotions, some really exciting emotions, and to some, Father, overwhelming emotions. Father, as the excitement of the Christmas is, Lord, hint, is kind of overwhelmed by the battles they're facing right now. I pray, Father, that as we evaluate the truth of the word Emmanuel, Lord, that it would give us an understanding of one of the great gifts that you've given to us, not just in Christmas, but in life. Father, I pray for those maybe seeking the truth of salvation, that today they would recognize it is found in you, not in church, not in religion, but solely in Jesus. I pray you'd speak to my heart. I pray you'd speak through me and fill me with your spirit for the moments we have. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, Christmas does bring with it so many different emotions. You know, there's nostalgia over the season. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have already watched at least one Hallmark Christmas special? All right. Several hands have gone up. I got another question. How many of you have slept through a Hallmark Christmas special? I expected the men to raise their hands on that one, all right? How many of you knew how it was going to end before it started? Never mind. We won't go there, okay? Uh, you know, you think about it, though, the nostalgia of the season and how they're filming this in summer during the middle, trying to make the snow look real, right? But, you know, there's nostalgia. We get excited. We get excited with the, the sounds of Christmas. I came out of Sam's the other day, and the lady from the Salvation Army was ringing the bell. But she had music playing in the background, and she was loving her job. She was singing. She was dancing to the music. And I'm like, see, this is what I'm talking about. Don't just sit there freezing. Enjoy it. She had the season there, right? We also think about the great memories we can create or that have been created throughout the years. We get excited over presents, right? All the things that we hope to get or that we hope to give. We, we look forward to giving that gift that that person's asked for and the look on their face of excitement over all those different things. And when we think about the idea of the list, I want you to consider some. Remember in Christmas, one of the many nostalgia, it's a cultural thing, but the, you know, the naughty and nice list that Santa Claus has out there, you know, if you've been good enough, you get good things. I read a story this week that I just thought was hilarious. A young boy by the name of Carter sat down at the kitchen and he was writing a letter to God with this thinking of good and bad in his mind. He said, I, he had a list of presents he really wanted. So he says, Lord, I've been good for six months now. And well, he paused and scratched it out. He said, okay, Lord, I've been good for three months. Well, he scratched it out again. He said, well, I've been, I've been good for the last two weeks, and well, realizing, and he walked in, and he saw the nativity, the wooden nativity scene that his parents had, and he grabbed the, uh, the, the Virgin Mary from it, came in, and he stood at that same place and says, God, if you ever want to see your mother again, all right? <laughs> this idea that if good outweighed the bad, I could get a lot of good, and you know, there's a lot of nostalgia that comes with the Christmas season, but you know, there also can be some heavy discouragement as 
The loss of a loved one is still looming large at this time of the year. Maybe financial pressures that are only exasperated during the holiday season and everything that all the expectations that come with it. In the passage we just read, we read one of the titles that describes Jesus. And understand, Jesus has many names or descriptions throughout the Word of God that we could spend time going literally for weeks describing. Each one of them really describe an attribute of Jesus and, and really what it means to us. And one of those is the name Emmanuel. It's an Old Testament word, and even Isaiah translates it, which means God with us. Or the promise of his presence, the gift of his presence. We know that this was a fulfillment of prophecy as at that time the world was waiting for the Messiah. And his presence would be part of that fulfillment, God on earth. His physical presence was needed as it completed the work for the atonement. He needed to be there to die physically to fulfill that atonement for our sins. But you know, his presence goes deeper than just those things. It goes beyond even just the theological to the practical. The understanding that we need His presence today. His presence is still with us. It's still helping us. It is encouraging us. I believe still transforming us today. You see, He came as a baby. And you know the truth. A baby kind of changes everything. You remember when the baby first came to your house? You were so excited. Then you went home. You were still excited. But now you were excited and tired. Because the baby changed everything. He changed your sleeping habits. Well, he changed the fact that you didn't sleep. He changed everything about life. And you were excited. And the moment you finally got good sleep, your child, your brand new child, realized that you had fallen asleep. And so that baby monitor next to your bed, he started, she started screaming and woke you up. I remember when our first child, uh, was, when we had him, he was a couple months old. Um, when I, I was uh, coaching a, a team in our school at that point, And uh, we lived in Columbus. We'd have to drive to Atlanta. It was an hour and a half one way. So I wouldn't get home until about 12, 1230, about every time we were out. And so I'd walk in, and I'm, I'm walking real quiet, expecting everything to be silent. And I'd walk in, and I'd hear the screams of my beloved oldest child, at that time only child, and then the frustration of my wife, who with the, you know, the bright red eyes had not been able to go to sleep yet. And she, she just couldn't put him to sleep. So she'd hand him to me. She said, you put him to sleep. So I'd grab him, and she'd go to bed. And about six minutes later, I'd come to bed because he was now sound asleep in the crib. I had this certain thing that I could, you know, just as certainly, she tried to do it the same way I did, but he, I was there, he was gone. He was asleep, and then I'd walk into the room with this, you know, satisfaction, and I've conquered. And then I'd get next to my wife, and she'd hit me. That's not fair! And she'd start beating me, right? Because she's been trying to since 7 o'clock at night. And she goes, you, I'm going to drive the bus to the game the next time. You know, there's something about this change. And we know that when Jesus came as a baby, yeah, he changed the entire world. He changed it all. But that change started as a baby and ultimately went to the cross. But you see, one of the great premises of this Christmas story is his presence. And I want to talk a bit today about the presence of Jesus from three different things. Please understand, Jesus did not come to the world to be a religious figure. He came to be a personal savior for you and for me. So there are three things we're going to see about the gift of his presence this morning. The first one is this, the need of his presence. The need of his presence. See, consider the chaos in the world at the time of the coming of Christ. All right, Jesus had came and, and Rome was a, kind of enslaved Israel. And so Israel's fighting. They're fighting over the, the taxation, all the other things going on. They had lost, to an extent, sovereignty to rule themselves. And there was absolute chaos at this time. And Jesus comes in, and they were expecting this Messiah not to ultimately rule and reign, but to rule and reign right then. And then Jesus is born. It had been 400 years since God had physically spoken to the children of Israel. 400 years. Think about that. Longer than we have been a nation. So all the children of Israel had were the stories of their great-great-grandfathers and grandmothers and the stories of what God used to do, the stories of Moses and the story of Joseph and the story of the great patriarchs of the Old Testament. But yet, as far as they're concerned, God had been absent for four centuries. Now Jesus comes into the picture. I think today we can understand that because we live in a day of chaos. 
We live in an absolute day of chaos today. And you know why? Because people want less and less to do with God. And we knew that. We knew that the longer our country would exist and the closer we get to Jesus' return, we were aware that the world would turn into chaos. Paul told that to Timothy. Know that in the last days, perilous times shall come. But you know, we live in a day of chaos because we live in a world plagued by sin. Please understand, sometimes we say, you're right, those people outside of church. Do you realize that while the world without Jesus is plagued with sin, the world that's inside the church is plagued with sin as well, amen? We all battle it. And it's still, it's where most of the chaos, if not all of the chaos in your home comes from. So we think about this truth of the need of his presence. Let's look at a couple thoughts. One, he's needed in the difficult times. He's needed in the difficult times. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, I'm amazed that we can often be surrounded by tons of people and still feel absolutely alone. We try to act like we're okay. We try to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, some would say, but we miss that help because we want to put on a good front. We want everybody to think we're okay. We want it to look okay, but yet there's something there. What is it? And it's this this emptiness, this hurt, this loss that's inside of us. And we try to put on a front, everything's okay, everything's okay. You know what? It's okay for everything not to be okay. Do you realize that? It's okay for just not to be okay. You come to church, this is the place we've got to put on the front, and everything has to look good. No, it doesn't. As a matter of fact, there's any place you can come and just your burden be real, it should be church. We got to look good. We got to put on a front. We got to want people to think we're spiritual. And it's the problem. We've gotten good at making people think we're spiritual. And yet we sit there, absolute emptiness and loss and hurt because we're not willing just to let someone pray with us and just say, you know what? It has been an absolutely miserable week. I do find it intriguing sometimes. And this is, this is just an observation. We're often more willing to go to Facebook and voice our frustrations and hurts and concerns than we are going to church and doing the same thing. You know, it's sometimes it's easier to post it on Facebook. You know why? It's the same reason we can text it. Because we're not seeing someone face to face. You know what happens sometimes? If I share my burden with somebody, that burden now becomes real. It's not even really shame sometimes as much as it, it's become real. And now I can't put a front. I have to actually deal with that burden. But see, that's why we need the presence of God in these difficult times. Just a couple days ago, um, I think it was Wednesday, my wife and youngest son had come to church here. She was doing some work in the office, and he was up looking, I think taking some boxes back or decorations that they'd pulled out. And I went upstairs to the youth room to, I, I had to reset the TV up. We'd used it a couple weeks ago in the gym. So I walked through there, and it's still dark in the youth room. Right at the entrance of the youth room is the closet where we keep all of the decorations. Now you understand, at this point, my youngest was convinced he was alone in this room. He had no idea I was standing right there. And I'm walking, I had no idea he was there. And I'm walking, you know, quick and headlong to the back of it. He walks out of that closet. He's like, whoa, and he just like screamed like, what are you doing here? He didn't know who I was. All he thought was, I got to fight somebody. I, how do I defend my, and he was freaking out. I won't admit to him. He scared the daylights out of me too, but I was trying to laugh at the same time. You ever walked through a building this size alone when it's quiet and it's dark? You know you can hear something else. Some of you have done that. You know, I'm going to challenge you one of these days. You ever want to know a good setting for a horror movie? Go to our basement at night in the dark. I'm telling you, right below this baptismal is a, sh- a closet in the basement, and it's got a pump that runs this. Now, you know what I'm talking about. You go downstairs, you forget the pump's there, you are convinced there's a demon in that wall. He makes the weirdest noises, especially when it's broken, it makes even weirder noises. And then you hear it smashing against the wall, and you're like, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. Years ago, the police were called in because we had left all the lights on and all the doors open when the school was here. I get called at 2 in the morning. The police are like, we need you to come lock up. And I show up, and there's four police officers, three humans and one dog, and a German shepherd just sitting there, you know, smiling at me. I'm glad because, you know, you could have eaten me too. And I remember looking down, and I'm like, wow, 
You needed a dog? He looked at me, he goes, have you been in your basement at nighttime when it's dark? We needed the dog. Hey, why? Because you're convinced there's something there. You can feel this eerie presence. Now, that's different, okay? But you know, sometimes when we're alone, we need a stronger presence. But we need to recognize in his time, in the difficult times, it's okay to go to God and say, God, it's just not fair. This hurts. I don't get it. It's okay. Because the fact is, God knows it hurts. God knows what you're feeling. We go to God and we try to be super spiritual, and God's like, just be honest. Read the book of Psalms, how many times David was so honest with God. It's a great truth. You know, there's a passage that has become just so powerful in my life. I go to it often. It's in Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers. And under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. You know, it talks about abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. One author I read was talking about, if you've been outside when it's really, really hot, the illustration's weak right now in December, but you walk under a sh- some shade, and all of a sudden it just feels a little better. The sun's still there. But the shade just takes a bit of that pressure off. That's what it's referring. It doesn't eliminate the things we go through. It just gives a level of comfort in the middle of it. You know, not only that, he is needed in the good times. You know, this can be one of the, when, when everything's going great, can be one of the easiest times to walk away from God. We don't have any pressing needs right now, maybe. Or our fridge is full. Our home is warm. In all that, we can forget that the source of our strength and our provision comes from God. We learn that James 1 at 17, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I understand God desires to be part of our lives in the good times and in the bad. Be like the wise men today and keep seeking Jesus. Don't ever think everything's okay. It's in those good times that we should still be on our knees begging God to prepare us for those times You see, when those bad times come, when those phone calls come, when the loss of job or whatever it is that comes, it is in those times of comfort that we get stronger to God that when those bad times come, we're not overwhelmed. We're not consumed because His presence is real. And we, yeah, we're shooken a little bit, but we're shooken, but our ground is stable because it's founded on Jesus. So let's look at number two the resource of his presence. There's a need of it, but then there's the resource. A couple things about his presence, the resource. One, he understands us. You ever get the idea sometimes, at least the world does, that Jesus just doesn't really understand us. In the political world, everybody wants to complain about the really, really rich and the really, really poor. And how it's true, the really rich don't really understand the really poor. Every once in a while, the professional athletic teams go on strike The other day I heard someone comment, don't you love it when you watch the billionaires arguing and fighting with the millionaires? Don't you feel bad for them? Oh, I'm just, you know, shedding tears for the millionaires who don't get the extra money. They don't get it. And sometimes if we're not careful, we can relegate God to the same thing. He lives in the beautiful throne in heaven. He doesn't get it, but the fact is he really does. Remember dads when when your kids were young? You know, when they, you know, they're beginning to, you're getting a little older and you want to play some sports with them, so you take them out to play basketball. But in most occasions, the younger ones, they're just not big enough. If you give them the ball, they try to do the granny shot or whatever. They just can't hit the rim. So what do you do, Dad? Pick them up, right? If you can lower the rim, that solves all the problems. But you do that when you get into your 40s and 50s, all right? In your 20s and 30s, you're, you're good. You pick them up. And you bring the kid to the rim, and the kid slams it, right? And for the next couple months, he's LeBron James because he's been able to do this because you've grabbed him from your perspective. He, you know, that, that basket is huge. It's too high, and you have allowed him to see it from your perspective. See, God does understand what we go through. I want you to consider some thoughts about why I believe God truly can understand. John, first of all, John 1.14 and the Word became, was made flesh, that's Jesus, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, 
to glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. See, God does know what it's like for us down here because He came in person, wrapped in a tiny human body. He lived among us, experiencing human life from our perspective and through our limitations. He knows the trials we go through. He understands the pressures we feel. He is Emmanuel, God with us. But consider a few things about Jesus. He experienced the pressure of living in a sin-cursed world. He felt the full gamut of human emotions, including rejection and loss and grief and heartache, as well as joy, encouragement, and victory. He knew the harsh realities of government oppression and felt the strain of poverty. He knew the obscurity and pain of painful popularity. He ate, he slept, he walked, he talked, he interacted with others. He grew, he built relationships. In short, he lived what we experienced. He became one of us. You see, most religions, they look to a fake God. But what we believe is we believe in a Jesus who loved us, he was here, and he understands what you're going through. You see, why is that important? Because when you go to God, you're not going to a superior being who's annoyed by the little battles you go through. You, know, you, ever, you ever seen that when you get injured, someone gets injured, what, is other, what do other people start doing? You know what? You know, I remember last time I was injured, right? You know, uh, when my son broke his arm, people come up, I remember, you know, I, I broke my leg. And it's amazing how the story of a you know, broken toe that you really can't do a whole lot about turns into some kind of massive surgery. You know what I'm talking about? It just grows. Because it all, we want to relate with that person. Tell about the time that we got hurt. That's a little different. But we can understand what Jesus is. He fully understands. He's completely aware. And when I go to him, he's not, you know, it's silly. He's not looking down that way. He is fully aware and, f- and truly concerned about what you're going on. But not only does he understand us, he helps us. See, Jesus goes a step further. He understands, and then he helps us. Jesus desires to be our helper, our guide, our friend in the good times and in the bad, in the bad times. That begs the question, why is it then, even though we have the gift of his presence, that sometimes in the midst midst of that, our struggles and our temptations, our grief and our burdens, we still try to carry without God. We try to move on without God. We still live every day like, I've got this, someone else can solve it. And yet in those times should be the time that we should embrace and enjoy the true presence of God. Let's go to number three. We see the power of God of his presence a couple things in the power is he offers a transformed life see everywhere christ went he brought change understand not always in our circumstances but changes in our lives i want you to catch this he brought change it says in second corinthians 5 17 if any man being christ is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new i'm going to take a moment speak to those who may be seeking truth of heaven hell eternity you could be here maybe you're watching online and you're you're still trying to figure this out maybe you're not even convinced you believe any of it and you'd rather just run with santa claus and ignore the truth of jesus in the manger can i encourage you today that he says if any man means in christ he's a new creature jesus came not to conform you to religion not to conform you to a certain kind of thinking he came to transform your life to pull you out of the drudges of sin, to pull you out of the pain of the emptiness of this world, and he came to give you a brand new life. So I ask two questions. First of all, have you experienced that new life? I'm not asking if you've been religious. I'm not asking if you've been in church. Have you experienced that new life? Have you come to Christ? Put your faith in him and let him change you from the inside out. The Bible tells us that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus clarifies there it's not church, not religion, not baptism, not good works. None of these things bring me to Jesus. I come to Jesus, and he develops those things in me. And in a world where there's so much confusion, wondering, is this true? What about that? Why do they believe this? And all these things, in a world like that, God says, I come just to make it simple. It's not about those things, it's about me, and I want to offer a transformed life. But you know, I look at this this, this verse, old things are past with will, but all things will become new. And then I ask this question, Christians, are we enjoying the transformed life? You know, God said he came to bring peace. Please understand that sometimes we get the idea that this peace 
in this come for come when God eliminates all of our problems. You know, God has never promised to do that. God didn't come say, I'll bring peace when all the problems are gone. God said, I will give you peace in the midst of the most chaotic times of your life. That's when you can have peace. When you know that even though everything seems to be falling apart, you're not alone. That's one of the biggest problems when things seem to be falling apart is you feel alone. And, and understandably, why? Why? Because well, I may be the only one feeling the way I am. I may be the only one hurting the way I am. I may be the only one with the questions that I have. And you ever been there? Look, yeah, I have a lot of questions that I really want to ask. I want to ask God. But to ask those questions, I think, would be blasphemous. I disagree. I think it's one of the healthiest things you can do is ask those questions. Why? How are you going to get the answer? Because what if God doesn't want to answer? I, see, I don't believe God's intention is for us to live through the battles of life alone. You know, well, we trust God. I do trust God. But God often will give me the answers I need. Sometimes the answer is, I know it's not fair. I know it hurts, but you're not alone. Sometimes the answer is, I've got something I'm doing in your life. But you know, even if God doesn't give you an answer, it's okay to sit down and say, God, it hurts, it's not fair, it doesn't make sense. Please do something here. Move in this situation. It's okay to come and live in that peace. And the peace that God offered in the Christmas time and through the rest of life was not, I promise that you'll never have pro any problems again. He says, I promise that you'll never be alone in the midst of these problems and I will transform and give you hope. That the world cannot offer. But he also offers, too, a strengthened life. A strengthened life. I want you to consider a well-known verse with me today. Psalm 23, verse 4. The Bible says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I want you to consider some things about that verse. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley. He didn't say, I'm going to get you out of it. You're going to walk through it. You are going to have to go through this. Whatever it is, you are going to have to go through from beginning to end and endure all these things. The valley of the shadow of death, that means there's a lot of fear, real fear. Think about the valleys in between the mountains and all of the animals that could come to get the sheep. Think about all the unknown things, that sounds that take place in the forest and all these things, right? Those unknown things are what can be fearful. I remember when we first moved to our house, we for a couple years owned a home just over the border in Phoenix City, Alabama. And I'll never forget, I'm talking to somebody, we were about to buy the house, and there's a guy, they had been in this area for a long time, we're sitting down talking about the differences between living in the north and living in the south. And he told me, we're talking about the fact, we're like, it's just so hot down here. And he's like, what well, does it matter? He goes, in the winter, nobody goes out for six to eight weeks. In the summer, no one goes out during those hot times. It's just swapped. So he's warning me about different things. She goes, keep an eye out for copperhead snakes. And now every hose in the world became a snake at that point to me. I'm paranoid about it. But he made a comment. He goes, I, we were talking about our new home. And I said, you know what, they got a fireplace. He goes, have they stacked wood out there? I'm like, yeah. He goes, don't touch the wood. I'm like, well, I got a fireplace and I want to burn the wood. And he's already cut it. Why wouldn't I want to touch it? He's like, just don't. I'm like, why? He's like, because that's where the black widows nest. I'm like, the who? I didn't even think about it. Spiders, what? I, I, you know, I'm in America. We don't have those. And he goes, yeah, black widows. He, I said, well, how do you know if you see a black widow? He goes, oh, it's too late by that point. You've already been bitten. See, the red symbol's on the belly. I'm like, excuse me? He goes, usually you know what after you've killed it. You've been bitten, you kill it, you look down, there's a red symbol. I'm like, what do you do then? He goes, you go to the hospital because you're going to die. This is like, this is literally how the conversation is taking place. And I'm sitting there eating this dinner like, I didn't think I moved to Africa or, you know, Brazil or something. I thought I lived in America. And I remember we went out. And there was the new house and there's a stack of wood. And I went over there and I would just kick this whole stack. You know, I had this hose. I don't know what the hose is going to do, right? Because, you know, I don't know. I kicked it. I'm waiting for these spiders to go flying. And I kicked a couple. And then one time I hit it, and there it goes. It must have been three million, I'm exaggerating, spiders. You ever seen that? Just like millions of them coming out? Okay, hundreds of them. Whatever. And I remember started spraying them. Like, jump on them. Kill them. No! What if they bite me through my shoe? That's what a Yankee thinks, Right? And I'm spraying them. I wish I had a blowtorch. All those things. And I'm thinking, this is nuts. Right? Here's the problem. I was always nervous. 
because you never know where they're going to come from. So we made sure we sprayed the house. If there was a cobweb, I'm the first one to clean it. That meant there was a spider somewhere close. It was this fear of what could happen and the reality of it. You know, and that's the thing. That's the idea of the valley of the shadow of death. The fear. You know what the whole premise of fear is? The inability to control circumstances in my life. And when they come, and that is the fearful part. What's going to happen? We don't know. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He did not promise to eliminate us from these battles. He just promised to be there with us through them. And that presence is real if we allow it to be. I'm going to give one more thought about the strength through his presence. You remember when you were real, real young? Who was generally our heroes when we were young, right? Usually dad. You know, and remember those old phrases, my dad can beat up your dad? I don't think we're even politically allowed to say that today, but that's what we grew up saying. Today, my mom can beat up your dad. That's pretty much how it's said, right? And so in today's day and age, that a little different. But remember when we were young, I mean, our dad was the strongest, the coolest. He could do anything. And so remember that time when you're outside and maybe little kids in the area, the neighbors started picking on you? You know, maybe you're six and they're 16 and they're picking on you. They're coming over and you're getting nervous and you're like, man, I hate it when they do this and you get all upset. And one day you decide you're going to stand up against them and you stand up, stop it. And then all of a sudden the kid's like, uh, uh, and they walk away. You're like, man, that's right. Don't pick on this six-year-old. I know what I'm talking about. You know what ends up happening? Dad's standing behind you. And the neighbor's like, I'm leaving them alone because his dad came out. Your strength was not found in your size. Your strength was not found in your ability. Your strength was not found in your presence. No one's intimidated by a six-year-old. Your strength is found in the guy standing behind you who's like telling the other people, get away, get out. That's where strength is found. And that's the premise of the strength of the presence of God. We, in our weakness, have to face whatever's coming. We, in our weakness, have to endure whatever it is that life has brought, that God has allowed life to bring to us at this time. We have to go through that. We just don't have a choice, unfortunately. But His presence gives us that strength and helps us to go through whatever it is. In this year, I encourage you, in this Christmas season, moving on to 2023, focus on His presence. If we're not careful, we can become consumed with the world. We can become consumed with all the things the world wants to be nervous about or angry at or all of that. But we have Jesus. We have a Father. We have a friend. And we don't find our strength in ourselves. We find it in His presence. And so a couple thoughts as we close. First of all, do you have His presence in your life? I mean, have you been saved? Has there been a time when you've accepted Christ as your Savior? It's not a religious thing. It's not a church thing. It's a personal thing. None of what we talk about will ever be of any help until you've put, brought Jesus into your life. The second question is this. Are you enjoying His presence? Hey, things may be great. Everything may be comfortable moving into this season. Praise the Lord for that. Keep close to Him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Things right now may be a bit overwhelming. Maybe a little complicated. Everything is more expensive than it was just a month ago. And it just may seem overwhelming. Keep your eyes on Jesus. His presence is real. His presence is powerful. His presence gives us strength. And it helps us. So I challenge you today, whatever it is that is overwhelming you, whatever it is that may be pulling you back, give it to Him. I also challenge us in this. We live in a world where we kind of think, oh, we can do whatever we want, no big deal. His presence is still there as well, watching us challenging us to do right, challenging us to follow Him. You know, His presence, if we're not careful, can be frightening to us if we don't understand it. May the gift of His presence be something that gives us strength, help, encouragement, and the ability to keep moving forward no matter what it is that God has allowed into our life. Lord,